Welcome everybody to this Wednesday show, the Writing Community Chat Show. We are back and it's I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am Chris and sat next to me is Chris Hooley, as always. Mm -hmm. And we're so happy to see you guys already tuning in the chat before we've even started, which is a very nice thing to see. Uh, Chris Hooley, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. I'm, I'm, we have been off for this week, but it's not been an off break. It's been a hectic madness like at home <laughs> um <laughs> Two yeah it's children been busy. under three is not fun um so i think i'd rather be in work to be honest <laughs> <laughs> well we can all feel that pain as a parent i guess um yeah. weirdly for you guys we had a show on friday and it was kind of in homage to april fools but that didn't go out as a podcast so if you're listening to this on the mm -hmm. podcast hello and welcome to you guys um and we're sorry that we missed a Friday show for you, but we will be back and we've got some unbelievable shows lined up over the next couple of weeks. So please do keep tune, tuning in and uh, sharing our stuff, which is fantastic. And speaking about sharing our stuff, we've had a tweet going around today that you may have seen, which is the king or queen of indie uh, writing on the writing community because of Indie April. And the engagement we've had on that tweet is unbelievable already and it's only been out a few hours. So if you do know someone in the writing community that is very much worthy of the title king or queen or whatever title you want to give them uh please go and find our pin tweet and be tag careful them. with that chris it could be it <laughs> well <laughs> yeah um you know a kind title uh you know go on to our pin tweet and tag them in and tell us why you think they deserve this recognition and at the end of the month we will pick a couple of winners um to crown king or queen and we will get them on a show perhaps so they can plug their work and just give them that Ooh. recognition um, so thank you, and it's I mean, a good we thing. Could, we've we've still got a few more days off. We could create a crown, like you create the king crown, and I'll create the queen crown. <laughs> well, like a, a, a paper one, coloured in. Yeah, it could be like one of those things where they do it on the screen and they put it down, and it literally then goes to the other person. That'd be cool. <laughs> what hands it? Yeah, but there's no previous uh, predecessors, so it doesn't really work that way. Yeah, but Next we year. hand it down to them. We crown. Oh, okay, okay. Ooh, yeah, boom, and then just crown them. I do like that. Fun. Um. Okay, um, we have a question already. It says, by the way, if I publish something this month, do I have a chance to be in the Queen? Well, of course you do, because at the end of the month, that's when we crown the King or Queen. So by oh. all means, send in your works or, and someone recommends you, you're in for, for the chance. Um, also on our quest for 7K, which was our weird tweet that kind of went wrong, but it's caused uh, a lot of greatness. We've bought 10 books now on that quest. And this week we bought We Gather by MC... Burnell, and I don't think it's an MC as in DJ. Uh, that's uh, initials for a name. So MC Burnell, well done to you. We bought your book uh, for book 10. So we're halfway there and keep follow, keep showing in that around and we will get 20 books bought by the end of this um, competition, which is fantastic. Anyway, should we get on with this, Chris, and get the beer token done? Oh, yeah, beer token book promotion. And this, again, is a bit of a twist. Um, because we didn't have anyone, and again, that's always down to me uh, being lackadaisy. Is that lackadaisical? Mm -hmm. Is that a word that Drew uh, did on his daily that words before? Word. <laughs> lackadaisical. Um, I basically didn't promote in time, and we know we've been busy doing not a lot. So I put this out on Instagram as a unique last-minute flash competition, and we did have someone enter, a couple. Mm -hmm. um, and this is someone we do know, so fantastic. This person won this, and they are sponsoring today's show. That person is Chelsea Callahan. So hello to you. I know you're watching and congratulations. Her book, Wicked Raven, um, is the the winner and the sponsor of tonight's show. And the bio reads, three years ago, a little less than two weeks before her wedding, Alex watches uh, watched the raven murder her fiancé uh, as the brownstone they loved went up in flames. Desperate for answers and revenge, she spiralled into the darkest parts of herself, using magic and drugs to keep her from burning out as she hunted for the, the uh, creature that killed Reese, The raven was an enigma unlike anything she'd ever faced, and to catch it, Alex abandoned everything and everyone she held dear. So that Ooh. sounds like a, a kind of a... Again. Yeah, kind of a crazy story. Um, Chris, do you want to look up and see, if, see what happens? <laughs> yep the book is up there um so there's the cover guys um please support the authors that support the show it's very very uh necessary for us to keep going and um thank you for doing that and entering the competition guys if you want to sponsor the show you know where to find it on the right community chat show.com and um, we've got some big big guests coming up so it is certainly worth sponsoring the show for that um right are you ready for the guest i'm indeed 
Yes, we are. And thank you guys um, for that. Right. Where's the thing? Okay, so tonight's guest, ladies and gentlemen, uh, she's the author of the book Another Life, which is a BBC's two uh, choice for Between the Covers, or a pick, as they call it. And it was released on the 1st of April with Penguin Books. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome jo Jodie Chapman. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? We are uh, fantastic, and we are so, so very happy for you to be on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, how, are you, how are you doing? How is the world of Jodie at the moment? It's good. It's um, yeah. It's, it's I'm still in the buzz of publication week because it came out last Thursday. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It's been really exciting. I, mean, I didn't know what to expect at all. So I've just kind of been enjoying enjoying the ride. <laughs> I imagine wow. it's it's been, it's been a world of uh, emotions the first book. Anyway, Chris, sorry, I interrupted you there. Go on. No, I was going to say just what is that publication week like? Like what did it throw at you? Well, it's been really strange because obviously bookshops are shut. I couldn't have like a proper launch party. So it was all done through a screen, which was really <laughs> odd. But actually, I mean, publication day itself was lovely. It was still really busy. I didn't leave the house, but I had like loads of lovely messages from people. I had flowers arriving, champagne. It was just, it was so, it was absolutely lovely to be honest. But yeah, it has also been quite emotional. So uh, yeah. I didn't know what to expect, like I said, but. I've really enjoyed it, and um, mm. yeah, I mean, you only you only get to be a debut novelist once, so I've made the best. <laughs> I've made the best of a COVID pandemic publication. There really isn't a lot you can do in this situation, no. is there? <laughs> and I mean, we've had you know really established authors just feeling the, the effects of this as well. So, yeah. you know, you were signed by um, Penguin Books, and did they give you a lot of advice in terms of how to to, to promote this instantly, or did you kind of think a lot of this on on your feet? Um, well, I've got a brilliant, um, I've got two brilliant publicists and a mm. uh, marketeer as well, who've been working on promoting another life. So I've been really lucky mm. there that they've done a lot of the legwork. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, for me doing things like this and doing my own sort of promotions, I've done quite a lot of social media on the lead up to it. Um, mm. so I've really enjoyed doing stuff like that, but I have been very lucky. I think it'd be very different to an indie if you were an mm. indie author publishing where you've got mm. to do all of the work mm. yourself, I think I would struggle with that because I do enjoy, I do enjoy talking about the book. Um, mm. But also if it was just left to me, I just, I don't think I'd do a great job. I'm not a publicist. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the book, obviously I can see it behind you there. Um, I don't know if yes. you've got a copy Oop, close no, enough. That, yeah. <laughs> I uh, have, yes. Close enough for us to be able to see the cover. Yeah. Um, I've lost my question because the cover has just completely well, taken I imagine, me again because Chris, I love that cover. Nice, it's absolutely it? amazing. I imagine that you're going to ask about, you know, give us an overview of this book so people that do, don't know what it is, they can have a little insight before we delve into the uh, the depths of the story. Okay, That's exactly so, what I was going to say, Chris. Okay. <laughs> you're on each other's wavelength. That's good. Um, mm. So Another Life tells the story of Nick and Anna who meet on the cusp of adulthood when they work the same summer job at their local cinema. Um, and they quickly fall in love. But Anna is from a very different life to Nick. She's grown up preparing for the end of the world in a tightly controlled existence where getting drunk, premarital sex, and um, Christmas are all forbidden. Afraid to give up everything and everyone she loves, um, Anna walks away from the relationship, um, and Nick doesn't stop her. But years later, she's drawn back into his life when a tragedy occurs and together they have to decide um, whether or not they're going to listen to their love or whether they're going to listen to the decisions that they've made to other people along the way. Um, so it, there is a love story to it, but it's very much not just a love story. It's also, I feel very strongly about this, it's a story about love in all its forms. So woven throughout this love story is the narrative of Nick and his um, tragic, impulsive younger brother, Sal. And so it's very much a book that explores romantic love, but also familial love, the bond between siblings, the bond between parent and child, and the bond between parents themselves. Mm. It's a fantastic explanation of your book, and I really need to take a, yes. a lesson from that because I'm terrible at advertising what I've written. Uh, and it sounds <laughs> nothing as, as well. good as that. <laughs> Oh, no, that, trust me, I, that's I fantastic. That. I've, I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you think that because I, I was having conversations <laughs> with my publicist on the lead up to public, publication going, I don't know how to describe my book. So I did a lot of, well, I did a lot of training right. on it. <laughs> I can it's tell fantastic. you, Jodie, one thing that attracted me to your book was um, a brief quote that said, 
is a mixture of one day and atonement. Um, and that was the feel and vibe for the book. And I've advocated my love for one day before. And as soon as I read, read that, I was like, wow, I'm definitely reading this book. Um, so right. how did that come about? Was that, again, something that you'd already had in mind that you wanted to write that type of book? Or was that a publicist decision to go with um, that so, angle? so when I pitched the book to agents originally after mm. I'd written it, I pitched it as because obviously when you apply, when you um, submit to agents, you have to give them comp titles, comparison titles mm. of books that have already been published. Um, so I said it was One Day Meets Normal People by Sally Rooney. Right. Um, and that seemed to stick. Um, agents mm. agreed with that. And then when it went out on submission to editors, um, they were also using those comp titles. So I think um, because it is a kind of will they, won't they? And it's told mm. through multiple timelines. Um, it's told throughout. I mean, it goes back to the 80s and the 90s when mm. it's Nick's experience with his younger brother, Sal. Um, so I think it does have that one day link because, of course, one day stretches over 20 years. Mm. Um, and then the atonement uh, comparison that came from that's actually on the uh, one of the, the cover quotes that came from um, Emma Gannon here. Mm. Um I, I'd never even thought of atonement, but actually it's it's strange because I read atonement when it came out. I mean, what when did it come out? 20 years ago, maybe? Yeah. Um, or maybe slightly less than that. And, and I read it and I absolutely adored that book. And I don't actually remember much of it. I just remember absolutely loving it. So I mm. wonder if elements of it I mean, because I can't really remember it. I don't know exactly how similar it is to Atonement, <laughs> but maybe yeah. elements of Atonement stuck around in my subconscious so that when I came yeah. to write my debut novel, maybe there were some some similarities there. I don't know. Mm. So when you when you came to actually sit down and write the debut novel then, um, why was love such a big factor in your mind in terms of why did you want to explore that as a writer? I think that's a good question. I think it's um, a theme that I'm just naturally drawn to and I didn't consciously want to write a love story I actually um, was inspired first of all to write the story of the two brothers mm. and that came from watching um, I've got three sons and at the time I had two sons and they were very small and it was just watching them play and I was observing their dynamic and I'd always found it really interesting that when I had my second son everyone did the thing where they go oh another boy as if they thought that my experience <laughs> would be exactly the same as my first experience of having mm. a son and I, I just remember watching them and they couldn't speak. I had them very close together. So they were both just under two. Um, so there was no language, but I could already tell how different they were. And that just made me, I just started thinking, what are they going to be like as they grow up? What are they going to be like when they're men? What's their bond going to be, their dynamic? Um, and I just started thinking about that. And then the love story came very much came secondary. And it just naturally seemed to... I wanted to write a book about love and just weave all these different strands of love together so that mm. the entire book was a, a commentary on it, essentially. Mm. It's a fantastic concept. And where did the cinema come into it? And why was that an influence in the past? Why was that the setting for the story? Well, first of all, I used to work in a cinema when I was a teenager and it was just one of my favourite jobs because I worked there from about 17 until I was about, no, 16 until I was about 19, 20. Um, mm. And I was a student at the time and I just loved it. I mean, it was dreadful pay. You'd work till like 3am, <laughs> but, there, you know, we were all the same age, everyone who worked there. We were all roughly in our late teens and they're such formative years. Mm -hmm. And we really did just have the best time. Um, you know, you'd have these big event movies, like it was the time of Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter was coming out. These massive, massive event movies, the, the, the mm. Star Wars pre prequels. The what, prequels? What, I don't mm. know the Star Wars orders. <laughs> <laughs> not a massive Star Wars fan, um, but it was like Attack of the Clones. And it would just be so mad and so busy and we'd work all day and then we'd, we'd go out in the evenings all together, you know, we'd close mm. and then we'd go out. So it was a time that was really important to me anyway and I look back on it fondly. Yeah. So, um, but it wasn't just that. It was also, I loved the idea of Nick being a projectionist because mm. he's spending his time making up these films, putting on these films, these love stories, um, these stories of other people's experiences and it's it is at the time mirroring the love story that of his relationship with Anna um, and also there is something there's a little line in the book there's a little scene 
that describes when he's in projection. And it talks about something that only a cinema projectionist would know this. So Chris, you might know this because <laughs> you, you did work in the cinema, didn't you? Um, where when a new print is played the first few times, there's a purple dust that falls from the emulsion of the print as it is, is drawn through the projector and goes super, super fast. At the end of each night, because I spent a, a stint working in projection, you'd, you'd have a little brush and you'd have to clean away all the purple dust that had fallen from this brand new print. And I always loved that and that always stuck in my mind. And I wrote that into a scene in the book because just the idea of how a new film can't really be enjoyed unless it disintegrates in a way and it, it gives a little bit of itself. Um, mm. And I loved that as a metaphor, really, for yeah. the whole idea of falling in love, really. You you, mm. you have to take a risk and, you know, there's a part of you that burns, there's a part of you that breaks, mm. but it, you just have to do it. That's a fantastic the concept. Is, there's so much I want to talk about in terms of projection and stuff like that and working in the cinema, but there's a question that's come into my mind and I, I don't want to forget it, so I'm going to ask you this. Do you think films have distorted our idea of what love actually is? Um because I get, I do get a sense of that throughout the the novel as well. Yeah, I think so. I think we're we're you know we're just sold the concept of love, and I think really the idea of um, being fulfilled through romantic love. I think you can definitely track that to the beginning of cinema. Mm. Um, you know, in the in the very early twentieth century. Before then, you know, when you the person that you chose to spend your life with, it wasn't someone that you romantically fell in love with. It was someone who was going, you know, who had an, enough money, um, who came from good stock and would give you children. It was all, it was very much like a business transaction. Um, and it was, it's only really, I think, with the advent of cinema that we wanted escapism and we wanted to get lost in these kind of fantasies of how else life could be. Um, and I think that definitely seeped into what people want from their reality as well so hmm. yeah that's a great that's a great question chris and a great answer uh one of the things that links into cinema and to this story is the comment that your book was referenced to being similar to romeo and juliet of our generation <laughs> and now that in itself is an enormous compliment Oh, and yeah, that was something that, you know, was a massive cinema production and, you know, really captivated people's um, sort of knowledge of the story. So how do you feel receiving that sort of uh, praise for your book? Uh, and did you ever expect that when you were writing it? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, when I was, it feels amazing. And, um, you know, you do as a writer, I think you always have a certain level of imposter syndrome where you just think, <laughs> really? Like, they can't be talking yeah. about me. <laughs> that can't be right <laughs> on my writing. Um, but no, I never thought about that at all because my I haven't always written. So I loved writing when I was younger. I, I did English at school. It was the only subject that I was half decent at that I enjoyed. Um, and I was always writing stories. But then I fell out of writing and I became a photographer. Mm. And for the you know for over ten years I spent as a wedding photographer. I wasn't writing. And then it was only when I was thirty, I turned thirty, my early thirties. I thought, you know what? I've always wanted to write a book. I'm going to do that. Like now is the time. Um, mm. And when I sat down to write this book, I was writing a very different book before I wrote Another Life, which I abandoned. Um, but when I was writing Another Life, I just remember, I remember it, it completely flowed out of me. Mm. Um, I didn't, I never had writer's block or anything like that, but I always just thought, you know, I don't think you build it up too much when you're writing a book. You can't do that. You can't think about, I want to be published by Penguin or, what your book jacket's going to be like or what your cover quotes are going to be. You just mm. have to get to the end of the book because you can't, in a way, you have to take it seriously, but you also, I think, need to kind of keep it very light. You don't mm. let it get too heavy in your head because otherwise it just becomes too daunting and overwhelming and you just lose sight of what you need to do, which essentially is write a page at a time, mm. I think. So I had no idea of any of these amazing comparisons when I was writing it, but it's oh, it's been amazing. Mm. So, Jody, in terms of actually physically getting down and writing it, one tells about the process in a little bit, but I'm interested to know how you tackle, because you do tackle tragedy in this book as well, and how you approach that as a writer, because obviously some of the things, are, obviously without giving anything away, very difficult to write about. So how, how did you sort of find the strength and how did you know, yeah, I've delivered that in the right way? That's a good question. Um, so... The book itself, um, 
I, I'm, I'm not afraid to go to places where the book needs to go, if that makes sense, if the plot calls for something and and I think it's important, I will, I will go there. Um, but I, tr I think it's important, for example, there's a scene in the book, um, again, not giving any spoilers, but where um, a tragic event happens about a third of the way into the book and you have no knowledge of the writer as you start this scene that of what is going to happen. Mm. And um, readers have said they just, like when it happened, they couldn't believe it because they felt that there was no warning. <laughs> but that was very deliberate on my part because I had a couple of beta readers read it when I first wrote it and they said, oh my goodness, there was no warning. I feel like you should have built up to it a little bit more. But I was like, no, I, because this was such a shock, this event that happened in the book to the characters, I wanted that shock to be mirrored by the reader's experience. I wanted it to completely come out of the blue, which I suppose in a sense is kind of a spoiler because you then know that something is going to happen. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I, I wanted, I kind of feel like if I, if I built up to it too much, there was a danger that I would start to write, it would be very melodramatic. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. I wanted it to be quite clean prose, quite, quite distant in a way, as if the character themselves, as they're describing it, has ha has had to become distant in order to deal with the tragedy itself. Um, mm. And the tragedy, there is a tragedy at the beginning of the book as well. Um, mm. And with that, I, I didn't write the beginning of the book until I was halfway through. So that was very deliberate. I knew exactly how the book was going to open, but I wanted to really know these characters before I wrote yeah. that intro. I wanted to intimately know who they were as people so that when I came to write that opener, I knew those characters so well that the reader from that opening chapter would instantly know them as well. Because I feel yeah. like sometimes with books, if you, as the author, if you start at the beginning and you work through in a chronological way, you're feeling your way into the characters as well. You don't yeah. totally know these characters yet. Um, and I very much didn't want to do that. And because the intro starts in contemporary time and then the book flips back, um, I wanted it to feel very immediate, if that makes sense. Mm. Tell us about this process where you deal with the beta readers, because that really sort of fascinates me where, where you send something out to beta readers and they give you advice, because especially, you know, as a, a fairly new writer, I guess, the how do you deal with that sort of advice and then think, do you know what? I'm sticking to my guns. This is the way I feel it should be. Was that something you were very convinced with and sure of, or did you suddenly think, am I doing the right thing here? Was that, was that an issue for you? Um, not really. I, I've got quite a, um, I, I trust my instincts. So mm. I've, I've got quite a lot of self-belief in that sense. And so I, I know to listen to my gut. Um, but at the same time, there's no point in having beta readers if you don't listen to what they're going to say. And what was interesting was that for the most part, they all agreed on the certain parts which they thought were strong and the certain parts which they needed work. So you know that if you send it out to three readers, and of course they need to be trusted readers, they need to be people whose work, you know, they either read the kind of books that you like, that you also like, or they write work that you think is good. Um, but if they all say, if they all say this part isn't working, you have to listen to that. Otherwise, you know, think about how how that number of three would translate in terms of readers if it was published. Um, mm. So there were there were certain aspects. For example, Anna, a, a lot of all of my beta readers said she's not fleshed out enough. You need to add more layers to her. So mm. I knew I needed to do that. There were other parts. For example, like the scene I was saying before where they said they they it came out the blue, they didn't like that. That was actually quite good for me because I thought, well, I want it to come out the blue. So yeah. I want it to be a shock, so I'll keep that. <laughs> what about the situation then when they say that you, the, you want more character or more, more personality from this character? How would you approach that? And, and again, when you were writing that character, do you think that was enough at that point before they were told to you know look back into that character? Well, I think in terms of Anna... Um, it was very valid what they said because I thought I had fleshed her out, but mm. actually um, the parts that they said needed more work. So Anna is, um, Anna belongs to, you know, shorthand, a doomsday religion. Mm. And I had direct experience of that because I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. And so I deliberately didn't want to write from the perspective of Anna because I didn't want it to become autobiographical. So I wanted to write from the perspective of Nick, 
through his eyes. Anna does come into it a little bit later, her first hand mm. account, but it's mainly from Nick's eyes. And essentially everyone said, I never named the religion in the book, um, but if you were a witness and you read the book, you would recognize the depiction. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone said, I don't understand what the stakes are for her. I don't understand her religion. There were, I didn't explain any part of her religion in the book. She was just kind of this shadowy, mysterious person belonging to this mysterious faith. Um, and so I knew I had to go in and layer it in, which was, which was real eye-opener really for me because I had grown up in that world. It was normal to me all of those mm. things. So I never really thought about how it would be for the reader because most, you know, the reader isn't going to know how it feels to be someone who is within a religion or a way of life where you believe mm. the end of the world is coming any day. So that was quite interesting for me to take myself out of that and think, what do I need to put in here? What do I need to layer in for a reader to really understand her conflict, mm. what her dilemma is? Um, so yeah, that was really interesting actually to do that. And Jodie, how did how did you tackle them from a writer's perspective in terms of the different time frames that you have? Because I, I should imagine some writers would struggle just with a straightforward narrative that goes literally from one day to the next, and that you follow that story. So, so something that's going years apart in spaces. How did you even begin to get that down on paper or you know on on your laptop or whatever? How how was that process for you? So the book is written with multiple timelines and it, it flicks between each one throughout the book. And I think at the beginning as a reader, there's a rhythm to it. So you have yeah. to get into the rhythm. And then I, but I think that once you're a good, you know, 40, 50 pages into the book, I think you get it personally. And I like to make the reader do a little bit of work because I think readers are clever. And I actually think they want to do a little bit of work. They want to work things out. Yeah. So the way I wrote this book as well was entirely out of sync. So I didn't start at the beginning, as I said before, and work all the way through. I, the, the film director, Jordan Peele, who made the film Get Out, which I just love. I think it's mm. one of the, the best films in you know recent times. I think it's fantastic. Um, mm. He said uh, on a YouTube video that I watched, he said that as a writer, you should always follow the fun. And I always thought that that was a really good tip. And because mm. I'd never written a complete book before, I was really aware of writer's block and that I didn't want to get stuck. And I mm. thought that if I write this in a linear way, then I could get to a point where I can't move past it. So mm. I thought, well, if I write it all out of sync, if I just get up each day and write whichever scene is burning brightest in my mind, whichever one I feel like writing, then it's mm. always going to feel fun. And I can always think, well, I'll come back to that later if I get stuck and I'll move on to a different scene in another time. But actually, I never got stuck, I think, because I was just taking it scene by scene I, mm. it was almost like I was writing all these different vignettes and then mm. what happened is when I finished the book and I've written it all entirely out of sync I actually had to go away for work and I printed the whole book out and I took it away and I stayed at like a travel lodge overnight for work and I laid mm. out all the scenes all over the bed so it was like completely mm. laid out and then I picked up the beginning scene and where I knew I wanted it to end. And then I just, it was very organic and very instinctive. I just picked each scene up and I thought, right, this scene is ending on a sad note. So the next scene needs to end on a, it needs to start on a lighter note and there needs to be this juxtaposition so that although there are sad events in the book, it never feels hmm. really sad because there's constantly this light and shade, the, the balance hmm. of the, the scenes. Wow. That's fantastic. I love how, that concept you you just portrayed there of being able to don't think about the structure of what the people plan out because people get so fixated on the way they should write that they forget about the inspiration and, and the light as you mentioned that that's what I want to write today so I love the concept that you just portrayed there and that I think the people should try and think of that more and just mm. jump into what seems really sort of nagging at them because it does happen you know you, you're mm. being you're thinking about the one scene but you think you have to write the next chapter which isn't always the case. So thank you for that, because I think it's a great, great uh, idea that people should follow. So Jodie, there's probably a lot of people watching that are obviously inspired by that as well, because that's a great way of working. But mm. then you finish the book, it's ready for some somebody else to see. Can you tell us about that process from when you had your finished manuscript to obviously signing for Penguin and then releasing your book last Thursday? Sure. So I finished the book. So I wrote it every single day. I wrote about a thousand words a day, roughly. I pretty much yeah. wrote a scene a day. So it would depend on how long the scene was. So I started at the beginning of January 20, 
19 because I love January. It's, it's a new year. You know, what do I want to do this year? I'm going to start writing my book. Um, and there's no, you know, there's nothing to really do in January, which I love. So it's like a, it's an empty, it's an empty month. Um, so I wrote every day. And then by the end of March, I had first draft. So I did the thing that Stephen King recommends, which is put it in a drawer. Don't think about it. Try and let your mind forget about it. Mm. Um, and I, he said, I think he says a month minimum, preferably at least six weeks. I, mm. I was like, after a month, I was like, give me those pages back. I want, <laughs> I want, I want to go through it again because I was so mm. keen to get it done. Mm. So I went through and then I redrafted it again. Mm. And, and it stays pretty, I mean, the book as it, as it is now is pretty much the same as it was when I wrote that first draft. There's extra mm. scenes added, a bit more padding, but essentially it's the same book. Mm. So I redrafted it then. And then I sent it out to my beta readers after I'd done two drafts. Then they came back, I redrafted with their recommendations. And then I thought, right, I, I have done as much as I can. I've got this as good as I can get it. Now mm. I need professional eyes. I'm gonna send this out to agents. Mm. So I had done what a lot of writers do and I already started following a lot of agents on Twitter and social media. And I looked at their profiles and seen what kind of fiction they were into, what they were buying uh, or what they were, the, which authors they were taking on. Mm. So I sent it out to, um, I kind of went a bit crazy <laughs> when I started doing it. So I had about, I had 20 agents on my list. And mm. I think they say, you know, send it out to five and mm. then wait and see what happens. But no, I was, uh, you know, I was far too keen to get there. So I sent it out to all of them, which mm. is probably agents hate that because then they feel like they want to be reading. They want to be the only person reading something. But mm. I was just sending it all over town, which is really bad. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and I had... Um, I had 19 of those agents come back to ask for the full manuscript. Wow. So you send out the yeah. first, you send out the first three chapters and a synopsis mm. and a covering letter. And 19 of them came back, which was just amazing. I mean, my phone was going off. And even now, sometimes when my phone gets an email, it, it takes me back to when mm. I was getting agent replies and the ding and being like, oh my goodness. Um, wow. It was amazing. That, so, that's fantastic. It really is. Yeah. I mean, oh, oh. What was your idea before you sent those? Did you ever expect a reply? Because there's so many people that go out and send these off and don't really hear back for maybe months, years, and then get rejection if they're lucky. So did you ever expect at that point to get, you know, anything rather than 19 out of Not 20 replies? Mm. Not at all. It was amazing. And actually, funnily enough, the, the rejection I got, the straight off rejection, um, came the day after I, I'd submitted it. And that was before I had a full request. So my first wow. reply was a rejection. But it's mm. weird. I kind of thought... I thought to myself, that's okay. Like I, you know, without, I don't want it to sound arrogant, but I, yeah. I did have real faith in my book. And, mm. and I thought, because as I was writing it, I felt like, I feel like I've got something here. I don't know exactly mm. what it is, but I feel alive when I'm writing this. And mm. I feel like I'm getting something, you know, kind of good. Um, so when the agent reaction started coming back, where they were asking for it, and then, you know, within a day, and of course, once you get a full request, what you then do is you contact all the other agents and you say, just to let you know, common protocol <laughs> yeah. is, you know, I've had a full <laughs> request just to let you know. So of course you then go to the top of their pile and they read it quickly. And then I just got more and more people asking for it back. And then I started getting emails saying, oh my goodness, I'm only halfway through, but I'd love to meet. And mm. it, it was, it was, it was so overwhelming mm. that, yeah, I can't even describe it really. So in the end, I had um, seven agents who wanted to who wanted to meet with me and offer representation. Wow. So I went up to London a couple of days and met them all. And oh my goodness, I was so nervous. <laughs> I was so nervous. <laughs> and right before my first meeting, I went into a bookshop because I had some time to kill. And that was the worst place to go into because instantly I was mm. like, why am I walking into a bookshop? This is so daunting. Why am I doing this? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was wonderful. So I met with all the agents and you know, worked out who I had a spark with and obviously their track record, um, chosen agent. And then what we did was we worked on it. So mm -hmm. she sent me her thoughts and I redrafted it. And then we sent it out to publishers. Mm -hmm. And um, Penguin, my editor, who's wonderful um, at Penguin, I think it was the next day or the day after made an offer. It was like a preempt. Um, 
and we went we went with that i mean I, I i straight away wanted to go to penguin as well as soon as i got a penguin offer i was like yes penguin, a penguin I've, I've, on my got, I've got two questions i really want to know the answers to okay. the first question is did you want to phone back that first rejection and say hey um <laughs> the rest of them said yes you missed out and the second one was that you had redrafted this over and over and you mentioned how you got this to exactly where you thought this was perfect when you went to your signed or, or your um your publishers and they you, they worked on this with you how far off was what you thought was perfect did they come up with was there a massive difference in that or was it kind of similar okay so first question um funnily enough i went to a friend's launch party and oh. the agent was there <laughs> and I was in conversation. I was in conversation with her. I actually hadn't submitted to her. I submitted to her agency. She was the head of the agency. And I wow. submitted to the agency and their reader had turned me down. So I was saying to her, oh, oh I'm with so-and-so so agent. <laughs> yeah. She, my, my agent is like, very well established. She's a brilliant agent. And um, and I said, oh, I've gone with so-and-so. And she went, oh, did you did you submit to us? I said, I did actually, but um, I had a rejection the next day. She was like, oh, wow. Well, Okay. She's really nice, but um, there was a little bit of satisfaction there where I was like, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Yeah. And then the second question. So, yeah. So my editor gave me her thoughts and they, you know, they, it was very much about, you know, certain characters having their, what their wants were more mm. clearly defined. Um, and also she wanted me to bring Anna's voice into it. So before then, it was all Nick's perspective. But she said, okay. I really think you need to bring Anna's voice in. So I went away and did that through emails and poems and brought that in. Mm. So, yeah, I, it wouldn't be the book that it was without my editor. She's She's got a really good eye as well, which is great. Mm. Fantastic. Cool. So I've just been really nosy before we go into some of the writing community staple questions that we have. Um, and one of the... Skip before we ask one of those questions um when you signed with penguin did you sign was is it a one-time thing or have you signed for multiple books because obviously different publishers do different things don't they um it's a two book deal so i and i've written my second book so i wrote that last year during the lockdown and i've edited wow. that so i'm now technically out of contract so i'm i'm about to submit my book three proposal to them to to hopefully get another deal that's brilliant. It's amazing. It always reminds me of because we're from the UK and football, American fans, sorry, soccer, um, that, you know, we talk about the, the, the players moving and transfers and, and manager, manage, managerial contracts. Um, so it's so weird to hear it from a book perspective and an author's perspective that you have to pitch yourselves again and again. Whereas, you know, they only tend to go with two book deals at a time or maybe at a push three. So, yeah. you know, for someone like yourselves who is still early in the game technically to sort of the longer established authors would you ever th think that you may change that genre and if you do how difficult do you think that would be to then re sort of establish yourself as an author they what they want to um represent yeah that's a good question um, i'm not sure i mean i i my book two is very similar well it's a similar feel to book one it's not a love story it's about female mm. friendship um mm. but i do always want to write something different so yeah. I never want to repeat myself. So the book three that I'm planning is not, you know, I mean, I haven't got a contract yet, so I can't really talk about it specifically, but <laughs> it's a different, it's kind of a different feel. And that's what I, I personally really want to do as an author is always push myself to try new things and do, mm. do different things. I think if I was going to write something completely different, like if I was going to suddenly start writing you know proper full-on horror or something maybe that wouldn't quite work and I'd have to use a pseudonym um and it wouldn't appeal to to Penguin Michael Joseph my current publisher um but I think I think for me essentially I always want to write a different style of book but I always want to focus on relationships and human dynamics mm. and what makes us tick and I am drawn to stories about people who are on the fringes of society who are slightly different um, so I think all my books will probably have that kind of vibe and theme. So there are, there are similarities as well. I just want to mix it up a bit. Mm. Amazing. So on to the staple questions then. Um, the first one is if you could change the ending to any book that you've read, which book would it be and why? Oh, God. Um, oh, my goodness. <gasps> <laughs> I don't know, now I've got to remember all the books I've ever read. Um... Um, because you obviously worked in the cinema, we can open it up to films as well. So you've got books or films, which 
to the ending would you change? Uh, can I change it to a TV show? Can I do that? Yes, yes absolutely. Because right. <laughs> uh, I can't think off the, off the top of my head for a film, but um, I remember I watched uh, several seasons of the TV series Lost, <laughs> yes. really into it really enjoying it and then i was just like where is this going i felt like i completely uh, wasted my life do you so, know what? lost i i agree but how did that happen i i can't get into this but you know you as a writer for this series surely you wouldn't let that happen and i'm pretty did. sure they were making it up as they went along didn't they didn't they the writers were, actually clearly. admit that <laughs> Yeah, but, but there's a whole panel of people that were writing this and I'm yeah. sure the three of us could get together and make a better ending and I'm moving yeah, totally. to touch a, touch a nerve clearly um, yeah okay <laughs> okay uh, the next question is if you could take a character from okay literature fiction TV film um, and write them into any story of your your own or a story you want to write who, what character would you choose to take hmm Oh God, I, I do not do well with these random questions. Um, oh, that's a good question. Or if you really, if you're really struggling, what character would you take from any of those situations and do something in real life with? Um, Chris, have you got an answer to, to that? Um, I think I'd like okay so I love I love Mad Men so I'll go for TV okay, oh, yes. I love Mad Great Men choice. and Roger Sterling I just think is brilliant and I would I, he, yeah. he'd have his he'd have his own book he, he needs his own story because he just lights up the scene of he lights up every scene he's in so I would I would you know give him a game show or something and uh, <laughs> give him his I own book I completely agree with that I love yeah. Roger Sterling he's amazing he's so good Sherlock Holmes on the chat, and that is a that's quite a often answered uh, you know response. That Sherlock Holmes is is one that people would choose. Um, mm. Okay, there's some questions well, we coming a, in. Yeah, we, wait a minute, we got a final yeah, question. Yeah. So the final question um, is a bit of a morbid question. So if you you're on your deathbed and you're looking back at your writing <laughs> career, um, what is success to you? What would you be happy with? Um, success to me is without doubt um, loving what I'm doing, feeling mm. inspired by what I'm doing every day. It's, it, that, to, that to me is success. If I really feel in love with my life, that to mm. me is success. Brilliant. That's great. We've got another bit of a morbid one. Um, if you had to, if you could resurrect any author or we'll go film director, um, if you could resurrect them, and do a collaboration with them, so make a film with them or write a book with them, on the condition that you had to then kill them again, which author <laughs> or director would that be and why? I'd have to kill them. Why would I have to kill them again? Is there it's a reason? It's just part of the rules. No. It can, it can you can tell us how you would yeah. kill them as well. <laughs> I, I've got to say how I'd kill them. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Chris, if you keep coming up with these morbid <laughs> questions, we're going to have to ho have a whole section of morbidness from Chris yeah, This is the morbid hour. Oh my yeah. goodness! Um, I think uh, who? Mm, I think probably film director. Um, I love Robert Altman, his mm. films. Like I love Gosford Park because there's just so much that actually feels like a book to me. There's so much going on there, and there's no, there are no real main characters. It's a real ensemble piece and all these little stories going on, which I kind of really love. Mm. So I, I yeah, I'd like to collaborate with him. Because he and he's also very interesting. He always made different kinds of films. Mm. Yeah. Robert and how, how would you kill him? Uh, I'd um, crush him with a studio light. I mean, that's a <laughs> nice <laughs> film director. <Love> <laughs> great stuff. I mean, that's Brilliant. a great, great answer. Yeah. Right. What we're going to do is we're going to jump on to the second half of the show. We're going to do the the family member from the writing community. We're going to get questions from the community. So, guys, if you have questions for Jody, for me, for Chris Hooley, send them in now. And they can be as random as you want. They can be book related. They can be Jody related. Whatever you want, send them in. And then we will get on with that. So, first of all, the writing community uh, family member. This is the point in the show, Jody. we praise someone that's followed the show on Twitter recently that may not have too many followers, and we send them a GIF. Are you aware of what a GIF is? 
Yes. <laughs> good, good. That's always good. So um, I will play the video and I will show you who that person is. So when I'm doing that, have a think of what GIF you want to send them. And everybody watching will send them a GIF in that sort of style. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so <laughs> that person is, let me find this person, uh, Maggie Winters. What a great name. Um, her Twitter name is at Mags Winters. And if you're watching this now, live or listening on the podcast, listening back, watching back, um, you can still do this at any point in the next whatever. Um, so she has 385 followers. She's followed the show. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so, her, but, just, go she, on. I just read a Twitter profile. It says writing about hope, love, sex and menopause. Yeah, indeed. It's not a, really it's an me. issue for all of us. Um, that is, the, it's not, well, uh, that's her, Chris Hooley, yes. So, <laughs> Jody, um, thanks, Chris. I was, yeah. Uh, what, <laughs> what gif do we want to send this person? And people on the chat um, or listening, you know, send, welcome to the show, whatever you want to send. Um, when you say gif, you mean like a mood? A of... mood? Um, an animated visual on Twitter is like a GIF, and yeah. you know, it's just a picture of anything. We've had dry shampoo, we've had dinosaurs, we've had cats, we've had everything you can imagine sent to these people. Mm. So any any subject that you're fond of, it can be photography, cinema, it could be love, or um, anything. Oh, dark. Okay, okay. Any um, subject. Let's send a Godfather GIF. Ooh, oh, nice. yes. Very sinister. Can't go wrong with a godfather. Okay, so godfather gifts to at Maggie uh, at Mags. Apologies, M A G S, right, Winters, writers uh, at Mags Winters. Uh, please send her gifts of the Godfather. So, guys, when they're doing that, please send in questions from the community chat show time, and I will start asking some of these random ones. And I know we have had some already. So, love it. Let's <laughs> yeah, Godfather, brilliant. So let's move back. I've seen them somewhere earlier, so if I miss them, I apologize. Okay, first one from Halo. Did being a photographer inspire you to your interest into human dynamics and relationships? Very good question, and I would mm. say absolutely. Um, mm. Because as a wedding photographer, you are witnessing people at their best and their worst, their highs and their lows, and it, you know it, there are some amazing, there's some amazing family politics going on interesting relationships people who haven't seen each other for years people who can't stand mm. each other um and it's it's very interesting i mean you're wow. obviously as a photographer you're spending the whole time with the camera and you're trying to interpret this day for the couple mm. um, and you're shooting the love and the moments that you somehow miss um but yeah i mean i've i've been very lucky with the weddings i've been to nothing Nothing too dramatic has happened. What's um, your best story, Jody? Your best oh, worst God. photographer story? Um, nothing specific, but I, you know, I've heard some best men speeches that were just like I was just like scarlet listening to them. Where I was, mm, you know, wow. you know, like the, the elderly grandparents were almost like passing out. It was so <laughs> so bad, so embarrassing. Um, wow. I've been to a wedding where the bride walked down the aisle, uh, followed by her mother, who was also wearing a wedding dress, which was very interesting. Um, mm. But yeah, it was uh, the mother was wearing. Was a there dress, more to that, or was this like a mutual no, agreement was... that they really involved? I don't in the know. I, I don't know. I never. I, this was very early on when I first started shooting weddings. Um, but you kind I, of thought it's, it's like a normal process. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah okay. I mean, I just, I remember standing there with the camera and someone behind me just saying, why is the mother wearing a wedding dress? So it wasn't just me that <laughs> thought it looked like a wedding dress. It was a proper wedding dress. Um, but yeah, that's, I can't think of anything else specific, but absolutely there are, you know, yeah. But I guess as, a, as a, um, a photographer in a wedding, you, if you really focus on the dark stuff, you get to see a lot of that, right? You, yeah, you do. You just see, um, yeah, people are happy one minute and then they're crying the next. And yeah. 
it's just a very intense day and you're with mm. you're with people on one of the most important days of their life but also it's a day that they've never you know they don't really have a rehearsal for the whole day and so mm. there are some people that just are completely different on the day to how they're expecting wow. um and I, it's definitely the same kind of thing you know you're you're observing people and i love people watching i something mm. i really enjoy in normal times is going to a coffee shop and just watching people just mm. watching out the window um obviously i haven't been able to do that lately but I think that comes from being a photographer as well, but also in writing, you're doing the same thing. You're just, you know, the characters are coming through you and you're translating them into the page. Mm. It's not about you as the author. It's very much about the characters in the same way that being a wedding photographer, it's not about you, the photographer. The pictures need to be about the couple and need to be about the story of their day. Same with a book, wow. really. Mm. That's impressive. Uh, have that. you ever written in a coffee shop environment with the classic rain on the window? Say that again, sorry. Uh, have you ever written in a coffee shop? You, you said you love people watching, you know, the classic <laughs> portrayal of an author sat in a coffee shop writing. I have can't you ever do done that. that. No? no, I can't do that. I need, I need total silence when I write. Wow, mm. interesting. Yeah, I, I, need, I either need silence or I need music, but it has to be my choice. And if mm. I'm in a coffee shop, I can't control the sound. And also I get too distracted because I just love watching people. I just what? like doing nothing but eavesdropping. I love it. <laughs> what sort of music is it that you listen to for your writing? Um, so normally it's instrumental. I don't really like listening to songs as yeah. such. Mm. Um, so I had a playlist that I listened to over and over when I was writing Another Life, um, which was uh, the soundtrack to If Beale Street Could Talk, which was a film mm. that came out um, a couple of years ago. It's by the same director as Moonlight. Okay, and right. um, it's the most beautiful instrumental music. So I listen to that and a lot of Max Richter as well in the background because mm. he's on the nature of daylight. It's incredibly emotive. <laughs> it's in so many films as well, isn't it? It's such a classic. There you go, guys. There's your recommendations for writing music. Um, okay, another question. I've got a question, and this is based off a short story series I'm writing now. If you could have one random object drop from the sky, what would it be and why? That's a really interesting question. Oh, um, well, that just instantly made me think of the Truman Show mm. when the light mm. drops on the pavement. So maybe <laughs> that, because then that would completely make me question my entire existence. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of light dropping in your answers. There are! <laughs> <laughs> the light, the sun is falling. There are! Ah! Yeah. Um, I'm going to kill someone. Have you got an answer for that? I was going to say a briefcase, just because a lot of films have, like, I'm thinking Pulp Fiction with the briefcase. Mm. And I was always like, what is in that briefcase? I'd like a, re idea. Yeah, yeah. a briefcase, just to, one that I couldn't open, but I had to try and f solve the mystery of how to open it. Hmm. Mm. I don't know, there's so many things you could choose from that, isn't there? I know, I was thinking okay. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the, the, he drops a whale out of the sky and a plant <laughs> pot. So either one of them would be very interesting as well. Um. Okay. Did, did you did some families you photog you fo hang on did some families you photographers uh, ever get into a beatdown with one another? Um, am I reading that weirdly? Yeah, did you some are. families you photog any of the you families that yeah yes it's a typo I think yeah uh, yeah get into a beatdown with one another uh, beatdown I imagine a scrap right. Yeah, no, that's so. <laughs> no, that's not that's not happened. No, I mean, I have I have had families where, um, you know, because of family politics, maybe the parents are divorced and don't get on. So I've had to be strategical there and maybe started the group shots with one half of the family and then <laughs> end the group shots with the other half, so avoiding everyone. That's part we'll of just crop popular. that entire <laughs> yeah. half of the photo out yeah. um, <laughs> with a scrap is. Okay, so I think uh, like, so I think I've avoided some. Yeah, Halo says speeches before beer. You're in the clear. That's a yep. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you Love for that. that. <laughs> it is good. Um, okay, so send some couple more questions in, guys, if you have them, and then we'll we'll move on to anyway. What we'll do is we'll ask now before those questions finish up. Jody, what is coming out? The second book you mentioned is already written. What is there? What is the plan? What can you tell us? So that book, I finished editing that a couple of months ago. So once another life publication is kind of, you know, it's died down a little bit, I think then I'll be working, that, that one will start going through the scene in, in Penguin. Um, we'll start yeah. getting the cover design um, and finalise the title. And then I think that's kind of pegged to come out maybe early next summer. It's not confirmed yeah. yet, but 
but sometime okay. around then. Um, and then I'm going to start writing book three this year, probably, I think probably September time. I just need to get, mm. I need to get my new contract and then, yeah, September time. Nice. So Jodie, I'm going to ask you a question now. It's a, a little bit different, but you probably get asked this, I should imagine. Um, obviously, your book has been compared to One Day, which was made into a film, Atonement, which was made into a film, and Normal People, which was made into a TV series recently. So if that was to happen with Another Life, have you already sort of planned the characters or planned your reaction to that sort of offer? Hmm. Um, I mean, kind of. Like, I had certain people in mind as I was writing them cert mm. certain certain people so for Anna I was she was always very kind of um like a PJ Harvey kind mm. of type like uh I can't think of anyone else really who's who but someone that's like PJ Harvey I think mm. like quite a kind of very strong bold looking person mm. um and then Nick I'm not sure maybe mm, I don't know because he's got olive colored skin Robert Pattinson, he's not he's not really Olivey though, is he? But, um, <laughs> he could be Olivey, I'm sure. He's a popular, popular choice, I guess. Yeah, maybe. And then for Sal, I always thought um, Timothy Chalamet or Timothée mm. Chalamet, however you say mm. his name in French, um, mm. with like crazy blonde hair, kind of skinny and rakish, and mm. yeah. And now, how would you feel about that? Would you be one of these authors that is wants to be involved, or would you be like, do you know what? I wrote the book. You can do the film. I, I would love to be involved. I would love to help write the screenplay. I, I would never be able to write the screenplay on my own, of course, because, you know, no one's going to let me do that. Um, <laughs> but but I would like, you know, I'd like a partner uh, to do that with. Um, yeah, I would I would definitely love to be involved. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, it's not a deal breaker because mm. they're two different mediums. But I think because mm. I grew up loving film and TV before I really loved books, I think... I think I'd be, you know, I'd make a half decent job of adapting the screenplay. Mm. I think because I write the way I write, I think of it as a film. I think mm. very visually as I'm writing. So mm. I think I could, you know, adapt that fairly well. Let, let's talk films very quickly then. It, it, what would be your inspirations for perhaps the stories that you've written? You spoke about how many things in real life and life experience is a massive part of, of obviously creating good work and real work. But are there any films that really insp inspired you to write what you've written? Yeah, so um, I'm a massive fan of Mad Men, as I've said already. I absolutely mm -hmm. love Mad Men. Um, and I, I rewatched it again recently. And it's without a doubt a show that stands up to repeat viewing because it's just there's just so much to it. And you see something new every time. Mm. Um, are, you, are you guys familiar? Have you watched Mad oh, Men? Yeah, I've watched Mad Men twice. Okay, uh, all the way through. Okay, <laughs> I, I I started Mad Men and um, I didn't finish it. Oh, okay. Chris. And I, I loved I, I love TV series. I love films, and I haven't finished that series for some whatever oh. reason. I didn't get the buzz. Um, but okay. It, it could Fair be enough. the fact that people bigged it up so much. I was like, you know what? I don't get Maybe. it. Maybe there's a few programs like that that I just I'm I d didn't get at all. Um, but in Mad Men, there's a scene where Don Draper is pitching to Kodak. And he's it's, the, it's called the carousel, and he shows um, he shows a load of pictures from his life. So he's he's trying to pitch for the to, to get their account to sell the slideshow carousel that goes round and round. And he talks about how nostalgia um, in Greek, the word nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound, and it's. Um, it, it's stronger than memory alone and there's something mm. about the mood of that scene if you've seen if you've seen it even if it's on youtube so even if you just watch that scene there's just a mood to it that has so much pathos and it's 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 kind of bittersweet because as don draper is pitching he's also showing his family pictures and looking back through his life mm. and thinking about you know he has a realization in this moment as a character and that definitely inspired another life. The idea of these vignettes, these memories um, of things that happened to Nick as a child, informing his present and his future and how he acts in these situations. Um, so that yeah. that's definitely a big influence. Mm. Fantastic answer. Um, there's one more. Sorry, Chris. If no, I was going to say you can't mention Mad Men without mentioning the ending. Obviously, we uh, talked about good endings and bad endings. Were you impressed <laughs> with the ending, Jody? Did you enjoy it? 
Do you know what? The first time I watched it, the first time I watched it, I was a bit unsure (laughs) when I when I watched the last series for the first time. Um, But then I recently watched rewatched it in its entirety. Instead of watching it over several years as each season came out, I watched it all in over one winter, like quite intensely, and um, I loved it. I thought I thought it was brilliant. Watching it in that way, I really enjoyed. Well, one of the biggest TV series of my life, uh, The Walking Dead, has been on for twelve years. And is finishing next year. Wow. Um, if that ends up rubbish, I'm going to have some words to say. I tell you now. Uh, 12 years. Anyway, wow. um, I will definitely pick up my men. If you, you two are convinced that that's worth doing, I will do that. Uh, but anyway, we have one more question from, a, from a, uh, an audience member. And then we will finish the show up. And this is from Ross Young. He says, is there a part of the writing process, um, the, rub, the publishing process, you wish you could skip, not including querying? Hmm. I think for me, um, I I love first draft. I love mm. the initial buzz of creating something, of being in the flow, of being in the moment. Mm. I much prefer writing first draft to editing because mm. I feel like editing is fixing problems, which mm. I don't enjoy as much. I prefer <laughs> yeah. creating the world and then working out what's wrong and how to fix it i don't enjoy that so much i like someone i like someone else to tell me what to do in that in that respect so you know it's it's very weird that i'm very much on the same page and this could be you're you're a panster or you a a planner uh i'm a bit of both okay yeah i would say that's a cagey answer sorry i'd say no no it's fine i'd say that i'm very much into film and tv as well um but i love um just seeing where the characters take me and I love creating um, just the first draft is so easy for me in certain areas and then when it gets to the second you know the drafting and the editing process I really struggle and it sounds you're very much in the same boat as that um, so it's it's very nice to hear that that's not just myself um, so how would you deal with that then in the further process when you're being asked to change certain things it, does that really slow you down or are you still quite professional in that manner um no, I think I'm quite professional in, in that manner, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, my editor's brilliant and she's really good at being quite specific and saying, I think you need more of this kind of thing. So then I go okay. away and think about it. Um, but I like to, I do like to leave it for a little while and then read it fresh again so that I mm. try and forget it. Because this is the other thing, I never reread books, like books that I love, I, I never reread them. I, I watch mm. films over and over again, but I don't reread books. Mm. But when you're writing a book, of course, you have to reread it so often. And I just get so sick of my story. I just, <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know how editors do it. I have so much respect for them. But um, mm. yeah, but I, I don't know. I feel like I just know the characters so well once I've got to like third mm. draft or so. I'm, and I do redraft quite a lot. Jody, your book is sound sounds amazing, and I'm sure the people the comments on the on the chat has been fantastic, and they've been very enthusiastic about your story. So, mm. please let us know where they can find that story, and is there a website they can go to? So in the UK, it's available through all the online retailers. Um, and seen Amazon, Waterstones, your local independent, Hive, bookshop.org, uh, et cetera. Um, and in the US or in other territories, it can be found on Book Depository where they have free worldwide shipping. Oh, wow. Wow. wow, okay. That's the first time we've heard of Book deposit- Depository. I can't speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so please do check that out. And guys, um, obviously, the sponsor of the show tonight, Chelsea Callahan, was a uh a, give- a giveaway a competition so please do check that out but in future um check out the be a token book promotion on the website and you can sponsor the show and we are so grateful for jody being part of our show as well so thank you so so much and uh for all you commenting on the chat it's been fantastic as well chris uh are you happy are you finished with tonight's show yeah i mean Another Life is just a brilliant book. If you enjoyed one day and you enjoyed Atonement, just, I mean, I'm going to say on a limb here that it's better than both. So just go and get Ooh. it. Ooh. <laughs> go on, go Chris. It's get more it real. Oh, it's more you, real Chris. than both. Um, <laughs> thank so you. Go, go and get it today, definitely. Um, yeah. By all means, so guys, check me it out. out. We, yeah, I know. <laughs> guys, check it out. We will leave links in the description of the show. So please do check it out. And thank you so much, Jody. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and we can't thank me. you enough. <laughs> it's thank been a pleasure. 
we hope that this book, um, you know, reaches the the heights that we and everyone else presumes it will. And so well done to you for getting such a great um, reaction to all your publishers and, and, and the process that you went through. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Much. Look after yourselves. Bye, guys. Uh, Bye. Stay tuned very, very uh, soon. We will announce Friday's guest, and it's a good one. You don't want to miss that out. So, guys, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.